Great. Cool. Okay, welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available on Pacifica Radio and iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and YouTube and at opednews.com slash podcasts where you'll get, you'll get the most comprehensive list of all the shows going back about 10 years. I'm really pleased to have Matt Stoller on this show. He's the author of a new book, Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. Matt is a fellow at the Open Markets Institute, at, which is at openmarketsinstitute.org. He's senior policy advisor to this. He was senior policy advisor to the Senate Budget Committee, where he focused on trade, competition policy, and financial services. He's helped author legislation on federal reserve reform, the concentration of power among banks, and the restructuring of our trading agreements. In addition to his work on the Hill, he was a producer for MSNBC's Dylan Radigan show, one of the best, I think, on MSNBC, and starred in an FX political comedy show with Russell Brand. His writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Vice, Salon, The New Republic, and The Nation. And we're going to talk a lot about his book, Goliath, and his thinking about monopoly and antitrust and big. So let's get started. Why did you write this book? Yeah, so I wrote it because I was, uh, I was sitting in the, I started working in Congress in 2009 and I got a kind of introduction to Congress. Uh, I was working for a guy who was on the Financial Services Committee. So this is during the bailouts and the crisis. And they were like, hey, here's the desk. You know, your orientation is a, a good luck with the crisis, right? That's kind of it. And so, you know, what I learned over the course of that year or two was that um, what we were facing, you know, and I thought at first, oh, we have this really significant technical problem in the banking system that's causing all sorts of social and political problems as well. and. Um, I need to learn a lot about the technical specifics of derivatives or consumer protection law or various other things. And what I realized over the course of the next year or two, and I think what a lot of us realized, um, some of us knew it before, but, but, it was, uh, but we had thought of the, the banking crisis as a technical problem. I realized it was a political crisis, right? That the concentration of wealth and power over the last 30 years or so was a political choice, a set of political choices in that the collapse was a result of those political choices and then how we dealt with those, with that collapse. Um, first of all, that collapse itself was a, a kind of a constitutional crisis, which said we're going to have to reorient power in our society. How do we do that is kind of up to our policymakers. And then the choices that we made were a political, further political reorientation of power in our culture. And I was thinking, you know, at the time, I was like, this, this um, it feels very uh, alienating and isolating to be involved in trying to deal with these problems um, and to not have any training, right? Any historical training on what has come before. And I, I actually was a major in history in college. I love history, but I never learned anything really about how banks and, and corporations uh, intersected with politics. And so I started researching it. And what I realized is a, a couple of things. First of all, that we had these crises before many times in American history. The last one, uh, of, of that severity was in the 19, was 1929 to 1933. And we've handled them differently. We've handled these crises with different political choices. Uh, and, and there are traditions that go back to the 1790s uh, that actually place financial power and corporate concentration monopolies at the center of our, of our politics. And that's the first thing I, I, I learned. And the second thing I learned is that in the 1970s, there was a culmination of a sustained campaign to get to, to, to kind of induce mass amnesia. So we didn't know about these tr traditions and so that we would not have uh, an understanding of our own political history and traditions of constraining corporate power. Uh, and then that, that, that campaign worked. And I think on the left, the center and the right, we all learned kind of a history that was false, which is that America had always been this kind of capitalist country where there really weren't significant debates about how to run our economy. And, uh, and that politics was sort of about social questions like flag burning or, or sort of narrow questions of identity. Um, so what was the mass amnesia? So, well, just, just to finish, that because we did not know our history, right, because we had learned this false history, 
then we were unequipped to see the financial crisis for what it was, which was a political crisis. And we were unequipped to deal with that, that the crisis as what it was, which was a challenge to democracy. And so we went in a direction which I think is pretty dangerous and we're seeing the consequences of that today. So that campaign, right, what is that amnesiac, amnesia inducing campaign? So uh, it was, you know, in the, in the first half of the 20th century, we faced problems kind of similar to the ones we face today, which was the concentration of wealth and power, monopolization of markets, uh, political corruption, uh, increasing corporatism and autocracy, regional income inequality, so on and so forth, right? And we dealt with it by sustained populist critiques, uh, so mass movements, but also legally rigorous m movements from, from New Dealers, trained in many ways by Brandeis, Louis Brandeis, who's a Supreme Court justice, to really attack the large financial holding companies that were dominating the American economy. And these were this was not just companies, it wasn't just like GM, it was, it was Andrew Mellon's holding company and um, uh, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, the DuPonts, they each controlled large swaths of the economy and multiple corporations. And the New Deal was basically a sustained attack on, on those political structures, as well as uh, we had antitrust suits against the specific companies that were part of those eff effectively conglomerates or financial holding companies. But it was a whole broad range of actions to address that. In the 1940s and 50s, however, a kind of group of leftists, right? And this is, this is what I think my, my book makes a lot of powerful people uncomfortable because I don't actually pin the change on the right. I pin it more on the left, um, somewhat on the right, but, but more on the left. Uh, it was a group of leftists. This would be John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a great economist, Richard Hofstetter, who's a great historian, C. Wright Mills, who I think he coined the term the new left for the, for the counterculture. A series of, of thinkers at Columbia, and what they did is they created a fake history of the United States, where they said, in fact, Herbert Hoover and Franklin Delano Roosevelt didn't disagree really at all about um, markets and, and, and corporate power. They believed the same thing. Just one of them happened to be lucky or warmer or a better politician. And uh, in fact, all of those disputes that people knew about, right, the populists, the farmers and merchants fighting against the railroads and the bankers in the 19th century, the CIO, the, the unions in the 1930s, the sit-down strikes, the, um, the abolitionists, all of that was, that was just a kind of, you know, Hofstetter had this, um, he had this essay that sometimes comes back, which is the paranoid strain in American politics. And he, he basically ascribed these battles over political economy, not to concentration of wealth and power, but to sort of social paranoia from people who were afraid of immigrants or who were afraid of um, sort of gender or social norms or who were just sort of psychologically paranoid. And he said that the, the political kind of stuff is just a sort of a smoke screen. And what we really need to do is, is uh, recognize that kind of corporations are natural monopolies. They just kind of progress just kind of happens and that whatever happens in the banking and corporate system, that's just a natural outcome and let the economists, the scientists handle that and we as citizens need to organize our politics and our politics are social questions, narrow social questions, not questions of political economy. And so the, like I think the baby boomers, right, which are this giant generation that grew up in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, they, um, they then learned this fake history. And so they, in many ways, when they saw problems of political economy, you know, there were reasons that they believed it. It's not all bad faith, right? Vietnam was the problem, the Pentagon was the problem, uh, not the, the banks, right? They weren't children of the 1930s. So they, they agreed with Galbraith, they agreed with Hofstetter, they agreed with C. Wright Mills, the counterculture. And then they, they became um, enthralled to that idea. Okay, so Sorry, that's I, a, want, I want to interrupt you a little bit because you've been going and what I, I want to try to summarize what you just said. What you said is you wrote a book because you got involved in economics and you found out that even though you were a history major, you didn't have a clear picture of the history of monopoly and power in the United States. And so what you did was you put together a book that did that. And one of the things you discovered was that in the 70s, people on the left played a major role in forgetting about how monopolies and trusts and power were dealt with. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I would say to shorten it even further, 
and it was the it was it was the transformation from citizen to consumer in our own minds. That, okay, that's that's, that's something I, I wanted to get you to cover because right. I think that's a big deal. And the left the left did that. That's the, the left, left. The left caused us to change the way we think about ourselves from yes. being citizens to being consumers. That's right. And being a consumer, it, it, you're already buying into a whole collection of messages. So what are the messages that, as a consumer, you buy into that are different from being a c civilian? Well, first of all, production, citizens. making, C C making things, right? Writing things, expressing ideas, participating in a community, um, all of those things, property rights, all of those things are not important to consumers, right? If your identity is as a consumer, then you are effectively asking for a, for a sort of a feudal system, but where, where you are treated well by the lords that produce, right? That's what consumerism is. And like Nader's movement in the 1970s of consumer rights, you know, it was very much that. Even though it wasn't, they didn't intend it to be that. They, um, they stopped seeing business as an important area of conflict. Instead, they just said, well, business doesn't matter as long as you have, you know, consumer, consumers are protected, that there's some elite regulators that interpose themselves between small business, big business, who cares, and the consumer. Now, it's a challenge because your book is a lot of detail and you go into the heat, great job telling stories and getting into the history of monopoly, monopoly and antitrust. But there's a bigger picture. And I, I want to make sure that uh, viewers and listeners get the big picture before we go much further. So what do you want to accomplish with this book? I want people to understand that that monopoly power is a rival governing system, right? We can choose to live in a democracy where we govern ourselves, or we can choose to live in an aristocracy, or what I think we called in the 20th century a sort of quasi-corporatist or fascist state. And that's one in which our, our pow power is held in private institutions that are very concentrated, so corporate monopolies. And that's a choice, right? When Mark Zuckerberg, when Mark Zuckerberg is, is testifying before Congress, He's not testifying, at least to me, when I looked at him, I was like, this guy is not a business leader. This guy is our global privacy commissioner. It's just that he happens to not be accountable to anyone. And Congress has refused to actually, and, and our, our executive branch have refused to enforce the law. So he's setting the law. He's setting the rules. And that's the political dynamic across all of the markets and in, in, in our society, is that, is that you've got this small group of people who are setting the rules, who are governing, because we, the people, have chosen not to support our own public officials to do that governing. So this book is about monopoly. Which, by the way, which by the mean, means that we can at any point choose to demand democracy. We can govern ourselves, right? The, the flip side is we chose to give up our power. We can choose to take it back. You know, I, 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 where did I put it? I'm, I, you, you're, I liked the final words that you use in the book. Um, I'll find them and get to them. But the, you, the final words are exactly that, what you're saying. Right. Uh, well, you know, I did write it. Here, let me, I have a, a book right here. Um, yeah, the conclusion is sort of rousing. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, the, so the, the, that is the choice that has always confronted the American people, liberty for all or small aristocracy governing our commerce and ourselves. To choose wisely, we must unlearn much of the history we've been taught. Many of us learned a version of our history as one of inevitable progress, goodness, and triumph. Many of us learned the in inverted version, that our history is one of inevitable sin, racism, conquest, greed. Neither of these is true because both versions airbrush out our own free will. The truth is, America is a battle, a struggle for justice, and we choose every generation who wins. That was the part I said. The truth is, America is a battle, a struggle right, right. for justice, and we choose every generation who wins. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting because I, I took a, a couple minutes from prepping for this interview uh, to start writing an article that I've been intending to write, uh, uh, basically titled... Uh, 
was it okay boomer isn't that the new uh, response to boomers nowadays uh, and and i guess so and I, uh, my title is okay boomer i'm embarrassed to be a, bo a boomer cuz i i'm a boomer okay. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it and you know right. and, and what you just said is another indictment of boomers that boomers embraced consumerism and 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 by doing that embraced the idea that they were no longer citizens and they, they gave up their power and that's what is so frustrating to see now. When I walk down the street and I see a guy my age, it's like, oh, give me a break. These guys, I mean, it's, so I'm really happy that you've written this because you're, you're, you're really calling for a reawakening. And it's, it's not like it's something new. It's something old. It's, it's, it's a return to who we were, right? Right. And I think that's, I think that like the OK Boomer, you know, thing. I think it's really great because it, it does sort of shine a light on a generational conflict. But on the other hand, you know, it, the boomer, boomers are actually the first generation that had a lower standard of living than their parents, right? So there's this perception that it really should be okay silent. That's actually, if you want it to be accurate. Um, and boomers had, a, like, were taught a lot of bad ideas and they did a lot of bad things. Every generation does good and bad things. And I think basically they, they, they made uh, choices that concentrated wealth and power, but also it was the generation that, that um, helped build uh, gay rights, that uh, helped um, equalize rights for women, had a lot of important ways of kind of changing our culture to be one that was less racist. So I think that like, it's easy to, to, to sort of ascribe a lot of, a lot of sort of bad values to boomers and it's easy to be sort of mock uh, boomers for adhering to a status quo that's clearly not sustainable. But I don't, I think it's like one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I wanted to persuade people that it doesn't matter. I mean, that, that you can change your mind, that there's a lot of courage in changing your mind. And a lot of boomers have told me when they read this book, they're like, you know, I didn't realize that this is what I was taught, right? I didn't know that when I learned about corporate power, I learned about antitrust or economics or something. I didn't know that these were the lessons that I was, was taking in. And so it's like boomers, there's a lot of boomers. You guys still have a lot of power. You have a lot of money um, and you're part of this society. And like boomers can change their minds and have changed their minds. And, you know, everybody can change. We can change our minds. It is as, as you know, Abraham Lincoln said, you know, we must disenthrall ourselves and then we will save our, our country. You know, we, we must give up on the quiet dogmas of the past. I think that is true. I think each of us has that ability. Right. And just as boomers can change their minds, it is very possible that we can go in a very, very bad direction, too. I mean, in 1873, and this is the other thing, I mean, in 1873, 1872, this country almost went towards real social equality. Like that was the end of the Civil War. Uh, there had been seven, uh, seven years from the Civil War, and there were battles over whether black people would have social and, e and, and economic and political rights that were equal to white people. And in 1872, there was an election. The radical Republicans won the House, the Senate, the presidency. They were starting to enforce the, the amendments, 14th, 15th, uh, 13th. And, and then there was a financial crash in 1873. And W.B. Du Bois wrote about this. this is in 1873 to 1877, there was basically a depression. And in 1877, people could never, I mean, everyone was in the North who had been like, yeah, we want social equality. Blacks and whites are the same. They were all, you know, four years later, they were just like, I don't know how anybody could have thought that. That's a crazy idea. And they had been disillusioned, not just about race, but they'd been disillusioned about business and art and society and literature, all of these aspects of society that had, that crash, that, that um, really changed our perspective. And that led ultimately to the kind of the fascist deal of Jim Crow. We can do that again. That's a bad thing, but we can go in really dangerous directions or we can go the opposite. We can free ourselves, right? That's the that's kind of the point here is like we can change our minds. It's not just a generational thing. It's, it's easy to say it's a generational thing. It's not just a generational thing though. So what did the boomers learn that we need to unlearn? Um, what did the boomers learn that we need to, I, I mean, I think, I think we all learned it too. Like that's the thing is that the boomers learned it, but it's not like, oh, and then, you know, my generation, I'm a Gen X or, or the millennials like learned it all right, right? And now there's a conflict, right? The, there was a break in the transmission of this wisdom that was passed down for hundreds of years about what financial power was. The boomers were the first generation to really not understand. And then they taught their kids 
and you know this the my generation doesn't know this either and i think what they learned is that free will and justice have nothing to do with economics and and political economics right now i have that to protest that my kids i taught them differently and i i think you know there are some i mean look i was a hippie and I protested against the Vietnam War, and I was tear gassed in Washington in the late 60s and early 70s. There were a group of boomers who, who got it and who stayed with it, I think. But, no question. Right. And there's, there's a bunch of millennials that are, that are pieces of shit, right? It's not, it's not a generational thing, right? It, I mean, in, in some ways it is. It's just kind of, but like, what people learn is deference to power, right? And I think even people, even I do this, right? I have to wi operate in a society where I have to prove using the language of economics and using the work of economics that my cell phone is more expensive than cell phones kind of in France or elsewhere. And that's a result of monopoly power. And it's totally ridiculous. Like I have to prove, I have to use defer to eco economists to say China, that we outsourced a bunch of jobs to China, even though millions of people said at the time in the mid 2000s, we moved our jobs to China economists are still able to make the argument, oh, that's true or it's not true. And you have to use the language and the data of economics, which is a corrupted language, to make that case. And it's because we have not rejected economists broadly, younger generation, older generation. We still want our witch doctors who are paid by plutocrats to tell us the truth, right? Even the ones, even the people who are like, you know, even the good guys, Right. And that's the, the capture that these guys have. And, and the, the fact is that economics is a, an incredibly conservative religion, almost, that only allows publication in certain publications. And if anybody veers too yeah. far from the basic central concepts, they are treated with disrespect or, or excommunicated. And the ideas of econ econ economics is the ideas of e economists are really, really problematic. So, yeah, so I, I, mean, I, I, I just, but I, you know, we, and, and you know, I've, well, I've, let me, I mean, I'll, I'll make it, I, I actually think it's a, it's garbage, right? And it's, it's pollution, right? Economics is intellectual pollution. So I, I, even the good ones, right? So people just I'm, came I'm out and said. that you were at, at the University of Chicago at, at recently at, at, on a panel and did some discussions with economics. Not make right. Just, I mean, the, yeah, no, I mean, and I, I say this to them, but like, <laughs> well, look, here's the thing, you know, somebody just is like, oh, I'm an economist. And I just showed that, you know, I showed that, that after the Civil War, a lot of, you know, in places where there was more slavery, more black people got put in prison. And like, look, I proved this, that there was, you know, all of, there's all these holdovers from the days of slavery. And it's like, I mean, Convict leasing was one of the biggest political debates in the late 19th century. Ex-slaves wrote about this, talked about it. Like, I'm sorry, but, but doing a paper where you like look into the numbers and say, see, we've discovered this thing that millions of people have said is, is totally corrupt. It's totally ridiculous. And that's even the good guys. It's like the people that discover, right? They wrote a paper called the China shock in like, I don't know, 2011 or 12, where they said, oh, what we've discovered is that millions of people's jobs were shipped to China. It's like, it's not a discovery to those people who trained their foreign replacements. Frankly, it's totally embarrassing that economists make all of those people who say, hey, my job is being moved to China, unpeople. They're not people, right? So economics is a post-mortem discipline. It's not even a discipline. It's just like, we cannot, we, what we have to do is, is let the disease progress its course and kill the patient, and then we can diagnose what's wrong. It's a totally corrupt it's totally corrupt. It shouldn't exist. Like it's insane that economics exists the way that it does. These they like, and it's insane that we actually think about the world in a way that is structured by these people who are just garbage scientists. It's like it's like we get all of our, it's like we get all of our medical advice from people who work for you know for tobacco companies. And then if you're like, hey, maybe we should not smoke. That seems like a bad idea. People are like, oh well, show me the data. And all the data comes from the tobacco companies. That's the way we handle our political economy. It's crazy. And, and, and the reality is yeah, there are some economists, usually the ones who are rejected by the mainstream, who are decent people who, who are doing good work. But No, I don't think that's true. I, I really don't. I think that there are, there are definitely some economists who 
Well, I, actually, sure, sure. Okay, sure. There are always people in a discipline that are doing kind of good work. But the problem is that the discipline is itself corrupt. Yes, right? I so, totally so you agree. Can't, you can't, it's like, it's like saying, oh, yeah, you know, sure, there's a, there's a, take a really bad group of people, right? Sure, there's a few people in, in any kind of gra bad, like, group of, of, in any barrel of rotten apples, maybe you'll find some apple that's, that's still healthy to eat. It's kind of like it's the like, Democrats, you know, there are a couple good ones and there are an awful lot of, no, of I don't think liberal that's, corporatists who are problematic. No, I don't think that's true. I think Democrats are uh, much healthier than economists. Like uh, economics are, are like economists. I mean, honestly, if we just got rid of all economists, this world would be a better, a much, much, much better place. There are millions of people who are Democrats. There are tens of millions of people who are Democrats. They have um, ideas about the world that are sometimes right, sometimes wrong, sometimes. I confused. meant the leaders. I meant the politicians in Congress. I don't. I don't think that's true. I, I think that our our political leaders. This is again. I mean, I think that on the left, people are addicted to powerlessness. I'm not saying you are, but but I I think like what you saw when when the Democrats attacked the Libra idea from Mark Zuckerberg. I think I've seen some really good things from Congress in terms of investigating big tech. Um, I'm seeing some starts of some investigations of Boeing. I, I don't think, I think like what, what Democrats in Congress lack, and I think this is true for Republicans, they lack confidence. They lack the confidence to govern, the confidence to say, you know what, my, I'm gonna make a judgment and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Maybe some bad things will happen, but I'm gonna try, right? And that's, because if I don't, I'm a, an elected leader. I've been authorized by the people to wield power. I need to wield power. Um, they're more afraid of wielding power than they are corrupt. And I think that's because we, the people, have not given them the kind of mandate to wield power. Amen. I don't, so I don't think it's a corruption. I, I, I totally agree with you about, I, but I think they have a mandate. And I, I, what I've, I've been writing lately about the the moderate centrist can't doism Democrats. Who, right. And, and I'm sick and tired of them. And I think that we're on the same page. But that, that's not a, but that's not a political leadership problem. That's a, that's 50% of democratic voters believe that, right? You go to, in, you know, you talk to the insurance adjuster who lives in Des Moines, who's a, you know, a, a, an ardent Democrat. That person is a, we can't have nice things Democrat. There is a real strong base of people that is as powerful or more powerful than the, than the progressive kind of populist movement that just don't believe that democracy works. And it's a big part of the Democratic Party. And it's easy to say, oh, we don't like Nancy Pelosi or we don't like our leaders. And like, I think Nancy Pelosi is a bad leader. I think these are bad leaders. But I also recognize having worked in lots of primaries, it's not like the Democratic base wants what we want. They just don't. And like, that's a huge problem, but like, we have to recognize that. They're just not there. All right, like, it's scary to, yeah. Anyway. We need to take a brief break. I'm gonna just give 10 seconds of silence so I can plug in a bumper for the radio show on. Sounds good. So we've gone pretty far into this conversation and you haven't even defined what a monopoly or a trust is. And I think we really need to get into that. What are, what are they? So a monopoly is, Brandeis put it, unified control of a recognized uh, branch of trade or a service, right? So it's control, control over a market, control over a branch of trade or a service. And um, it doesn't have to be one company. It can be several companies, but the idea is unified control. And, you know, so, so, and it's confusing too, because you can have a monopoly that is not, that doesn't necessarily always look like a monopoly, right? So Apple makes iPhones. And I think to a lot of people, they would say, well, I can go buy a Samsung phone or, or a, other kinds of phones. And so I have choices. Apple is not a monopoly. And that is true in the sense that you can go and you can buy a different phone. And so, and all of the different phones have the Google Android operating system. So you have two choices, right? You have, you have the Apple iOS and you have Android phones, right? But if you make apps, right, if you make apps or you update apps um, or you are a supplier to Apple uh, or, you know, you, you are a specialist in the, in the uh, Apple iOS, you are subject to the whim of a monopolist. Like I can't get to iPhone customers if I make an app except by going through the Apple iPhone store. And that's true for, you know, people who want to get to the Android phones 
like maybe you as a consumer have one other choice of a phone to buy. You get locked in. There are problems with only having one choice. But if you make a phone component, if you make a software product for a phone, um, if you need to use that phone from the producer side, then yeah, you are subject to not just one monopolist, but two, right? Because to get to iPhone customers. So that, 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 that's, it gets confusing, but monopoly, monopoly power is about control. It's not always about controlling consumers. It can be about controlling consumers. It's also about controlling producers, suppliers, workers, farmers. You know. Now you've just, you've characterized monopoly as lawlessness too. It's a violation right. of law. Get into that. Right, so we've passed a number, so anti-monopoly rules and antitrust statutes have been a part of the American political economy for 200 years. Go back to the, to the um, early 1800s. Uh, in, in industrial monopolies were kind of started to be important in the 1870s and 1880s. And usually we, we had state level regulation and rules. And then in 1890, we passed a law called the Sherman Act. And the Sherman Antitrust Act said, they not old monopolies used to be called trusts. Doesn't really matter why. They used to be called trusts, and so it was called the Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act basically said that monopolization is illegal. It's both a violation of civil law and it's a criminal. Uh, it's a violation of criminal law. So if you monopolize, and it didn't define monopolization, it didn't also other things like restraints of trade, but it did say that that's a crime, and so it is a crime when you monopolize. And what we have is monopolization across the economy, which means you know, that's, that's a function of violating the law. And so we have lawlessness across the economy because we don't enforce the Sherman Act. And you, you, get in, you, you, you already discussed how there was, there's been a, a concentrated effort to sabotage our, our memory of our standing up to, to monopoly and to change right. our way of thinking about it. But, and then you say that monopoly, the, the battle against monopoly is our fight today. It's the that's fight. Right. And right. how do you put that into context of everything else that's going on? Well, look, I mean, we have a problem with an existential threat of climate change. We have an existential threat of, of Chinese expansionist autocracy. Uh, and we have a, a, a threat of domestic corruption and white supremacy. All of these problems, right, work through monopolies, right? All of them, the, the inability for us to come together collectively to address our problems is a function of the fact that monopolies have broken our politics and are trying to replace our social institutions with their own social institutions that they control. Facebook controls our electoral apparatus. Um, and then, you know, a host of electric utilities control how we, uh, how we use electricity. And then a bunch of media companies under the thumb now, increasingly of China. These are companies like Disney, um, or companies like um, you know, like the NBA. They are increasingly uh, they are increasingly controlling us because they have market power, and then because our government is too weak to stand up to them, but the Chinese government is strong enough to manipulate them. So. What we're, and then a lot of the problems, social problems that we are finding like rapid and rancid political in, income inequality, um, wealth inequality, regional inequality, huge healthcare costs, right? Crazy healthcare costs. All of these are 100% a function of monopoly power, right? Low wages, function of monopoly power. We as workers, as producers, we have fewer places to go and, and get work. And so they, they, they have less of incentive to pay us more. Hospitals have been raising prices systematically for instance, the 1980s because they've been merging and becoming engaged in more and more market power. 40% of places in the country, 40% of hospital beds are occupied by in, in markets where there's only one hospital system to take care of people and they just keep raising prices. A lot of the regional inequality, the, the distinctions between the Trump and the democratic areas are a function of you have a lot, bunch of monopolists that are in kind of blue cities and they are pulling wealth from rural areas and driving up rents in blue areas, creating regional inequality and inequality within blue cities. So it's like pretty much every, not every, but most of the social problems. And you know, and then also a lot of the monopolists are run by people who are, uh, who are white supremacists or who are, are not white supremacists, but don't really care about racial 
equality and don't equalize access to their platforms. So if you look at the 100 wealthiest people in America, most of them are made their money through monopoly and not a single one is African American. Right? Okay, so I'm Contest. gonna ask you again. Sorry, I just, yeah. What's the goal of this book? Short and sweet. Well, I mean, to learn that we have taken back our democracy in the past and we can do so again. Okay. So, uh, you know, I wrote the book, Bottom Up Revolution, and I, uh, was that an eye roll? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I just feel like I'm, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit and I don't, I, you, you know, I, no, you're that, going into depth and, 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 yeah. and that's great. And that's what the yeah. book does. But uh, my right. job is to kind of focus and refocus so we can make sure we get everything accomplished in the time. Sure, sure. So, sure. uh, I, I believe that we're, we're shifting from a bottom to, from a top down culture, which is, which monopoly is all about to a more bottom up. Right. And I'm hopeful because I think that it's in our genes. I think that before there was civilization, there, there was no such thing as monopoly. Everybody shared with each other and took care of each other. And there are literally hundreds of genes that are all about empathy and compassion and cooperation and interdependence. And, and really what you're talking about is, is, is some of the stuff that I get into, like, like getting back to the way we were 100 years ago, because we were doing better then, really, than we are now. And the other thing is, I, I and I well, I think I think that's a, I think in some ways we were so the threats we face today are as extreme or more extreme than they were a hundred years ago. I think it would be hard to go back to like, you know, a hundred years ago is nineteen nineteen. Pretty hard to go back to nineteen nineteen, and say to like some one hundred twenty like, hundred thirty years. I'm talking about. But I mean, I'm just saying like like the there was a lot of really depending on who you are, it nineteen nineteen was not a good year. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, so, but, but um, we're, for what it's we're worth, fighting. let's contextualize it. I mean, what you've so. said is that we've forgotten that we have this amnesia that, that, this yeah, no, that's right. Process took place. And back then people thought of themselves as having the power and now they don't. And, that's right. And, and, and I think that well, white, white people, like it's important. Like there was the, the, the antitrust, the anti-monopoly movement, the great flaw in producerism. And I think both sides, like great flaw of the monopolists and the great flaw of the anti-monopolists, although it was more, it's worse for the monopolists historically. But you know, white supremacy has really always been the other core um, axis of debate for, uh, for America. And so, you know, there, the book that I, you know, Goliath is about, uh, I kind of characterize Wright Patman, who's a congressman from rural Texas, fought big banks, fought monopolies, uh, fought high interest rates, kind of wanted to broadly distribute economic power. He had a pretty good record for rural Texas on race. Uh, in many ways, he pushed through a lot of things that equalized economic opportunity. But he also voted for segregation in the 1950s. And there was a, kind of a lot of that inability to overcome that fundamental um, racism, that cultural racism in America. And I think what's what's uh, the, the great challenge and, and back in the, in the 20th century was how do we convince basically large numbers of white people that everybody is, is equal, that they shouldn't be racist. And I think that, that it, you still have a lot of racism today, but it's not, uh, it's not tolerated the same way that it was. Like racism is a, understood as a bad thing. We have a language to talk about it. And so we can, we've embedded racism in a lot of our institutions but it's less and less embedded in our, in our actual culture. And that makes it fixable in a way that it wasn't 100 years ago. Okay. Um, okay, that's, that, I'm not sure where that ties in with the book though. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, the, you, we were talking about, you know, where things, are, things were not 100, you said things were better 100 years ago. In terms of racism, things are a lot better than they were then. But the yeah, and then, and then important, there were important, if, so this book is about democracy, right? And so you look at something like Comcast, right? Comcast um, bought NBC, Comcast rolled up a whole bunch of power. Uh, one of the ways that they did it was by bringing in the support of black political leaders and black communities because they gave a bunch of money, chair, they have charitable arms, they work a lot on diversity and they've essentially argued Comcast, but then a lot of companies do this. We're gonna give you the things, if you let us concentrate power, 
we will be, we will give you the things that white people already get. We will serve as a righteous government for you, or at least better than the situation that you have now. Because if you don't allow us to concentrate power, then maybe we won't be as powerful, but, this, but society will stay as racist as it is now. So we'll get you extra broadband, right? We'll get you a little more diversity. Just trust us, right? That was the deal that Comcast kind of made. And it's a deal that's pretty hard to turn down if you're, if you're a marginalized community where you have no wealth, where you're subjected to cultural attacks. It's like that deal is fundamental to how monopolists sustain power. And that deal only exists because, uh, because we have sustained racism that we haven't been able to deal with in the anti-monopoly uh, movements traditionally. We can, we, we, ha we can deal with them now, but it is fundamental to the political architecture that we're trying to build of a genuine multiracial democracy. That's daunting. I mean, what you're saying is that monopolists get people to sell out some aspect of their rights in order to get other rights. That's right. But the reason that they're able to do that is because, you know, we have a, a, a society in which there are a lot of people who are really poor and who are really disempowered. And, you know, when you are really poor and disempowered, you are not necessarily, the first thing that you're looking for is not necessarily the liberty to speak your mind. It's maybe it's food, it's medicine, it's basic transportation services. And like, if we have a racist society, right, if we don't address racism, which means addressing wealth and income gaps, um, then that deal will always be available to monopolists, right? And we, none of us will be free. So it is daunting, but it's also fixable. That's what's so exciting about this moment. I mean, Black Lives Matter, and, and the kind of the new wave of, of progressive prosecutors and then Occupy Wall Street and also the, the new anti-monopolism on the right and the monopolism, anti-monopolism within the military and within corporate America. You're seeing this broad rethink of the fundamentals of our society and that's so exciting and so important. We really can do it right this time. We may not, but it is up to us to do it right this time. Uh, I believe you. Uh, we, we need to take another brief break and then we're gonna talk about too big and about decentralization. Thanks. Okay. And my guest for this show is Matt Stoller. He's the author of Goliath, the hundred year war between monopoly power and democracy. So Matt, you say that big is a problem. You say that we need to decentralize. How does this tie in with your writing about monopoly? Right. So if you look at, we look around the economy today, you see monopolies kind of everywhere. Uh, and this causes a lot of social problems we've talked about. It also increases the size of our corporations. Our corporations are bigger than they used to be and they're older than they used to be. And so you, they're not getting as replaced as often. And so what you're seeing is an increase in, increase of size of these corporations and, uh, and an increase in brittleness in these corporations. So when you, when you, um, when you increase the size of banks, for example, you get banks that are too big to fail. You not only pool banking power and commercial power and financial power, but you pool risk. When you pool, um, say, like the aerospace, civilian aerospace industry, as we have into one company, to Boeing, then you also pool risk, right? And we have, uh, we have a pooling of risk across our society because you have companies that are increasingly large, increasingly old, increasingly badly managed. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a crisis that we're, that we're increasingly starting to come to grips with. Um, we haven't gotten to these solutions yet, which are pretty obvious, which is if something is too big, make it smaller. Uh, but that's, but wait, that's the problem. Wait, that's the problem. Uh, let's, let's go with those solutions, okay? Because I wrote, that's something I, I, I've thought about, I, and I've written a lot about it. I've written a lot of articles about it, and it's in my book, Bottom Up Revolution. Uh, I think that we need to develop a science of small. We need to come up with policies. We need to come up with strategies to keep businesses small, to, to discourage them from becoming monopolies. Now, you reel off a list, whether it's Google or Amazon, of companies that they should not have been allowed to acquire. Why don't you throw that list right. at us? Well, look, I mean, part of this is a philosophy, which I think you're right about. I think it's about recognizing that we want uh, small and smaller economic institutions. This is Thomas Jefferson, a yeoman farmer, but that was kind of came from the levelers in the, in the 1600s. And you roll that forward. In my book, I write about, you know, farm supports, which were, which were designed to, de to decentralize land ownership and to make sure that farmers could, could 
um, earn the fruits of the soil that they farmed, or, or patents, which were originally about protecting engineers from financiers and copyrights, which were about protecting artists from monopolists and financiers. There's a whole set, and then labor like unions, which, which were about when you need economies of scale, just because of technical requirements, it's about protecting the, the workers who are, who are in those larger institutions. So what you see is um, there's a kind of mosaic of policies that are designed to protect the producer and if possible to keep, uh, to keep institutions small. Now with something like, and part of that is anti-merger policy, right? So there's a bunch of things that are, you know, like unions and patents and copyrights and co-ops, credit unions, a whole bunch of things that are designed to protect the little guy and help us to band together. And there's a bunch of things that are designed to stop the big guy or the capitalist from getting bigger. And this is antitrust policy. These are anti-merger laws. Um, so when Google bought, you know, Google was a major online advertiser uh, and marketplace for online ads. And there was another big online marketplace for ads and it was called DoubleClick. In 2007 or eight, Google bought DoubleClick. Uh, Google was a big search engine. YouTube was a big online video market. In 2005, Google bought YouTube, right? Um, if you go through, Google bought about, I don't know, 60 to 100 companies between 2004 and 2014. Facebook was a social network, and then it, it ended up buying another social network, Instagram, and then another social network, WhatsApp. So those are acquisitions that if they had not been allowed, then, um, you know, the, you would, the companies would just, they would be smaller and competing with each other. And why aren't example, they allowed? Why are, not, why are they not allowed? Well, the, the law says that, the Clayton Act, which was passed in, in 1913, says that um, that mergers that are that substantially may substantially uh, lessen competition. Right? That, and that was, I think, that's the may substantially lessen, right? And those are those are that's kind of vague language. And so the way that the consumer rights movement played into this is that you know, and this is the University of Chicago, they tricked the liberals into supporting consumerism and and a particular noxious form of it. They said, well, the way that you determine whether that, that you substantially lessen competition is you just look at prices. So if, if, if the merger of two companies will end up raising prices to consumers, then it's an anti-competitive merger. But if they don't end up raising prices to consumers, then it's fine. Well, well now what do you do? That's what do you do when, you, well, it's, 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 a, um, it's a particular way that I think it, it was really validating to the judges and lawyers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s because it let them say, oh, now we can just ask the scientists. We can just ask the economists who will tell us based on these objective metrics of price yes, the whether this is a merger. Right, it's the economists and the scientists, but also the judges and the lawyers that were like, yes, we need, um, we want an objective measure, which of course you can't be object. There's no objective measure of justice, right? But they wanted him. So they replaced- well, the other side of it is when you're talking about digital e companies, then, then money is, is, is a minor piece of it because well, it's that, about that, the price, right. it's, it's about data and it's about power and it's about access. Right. Leaving all of that out, it's crazy. Yep. That's what I was gonna get to. It, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, one of the consequences of this legal revolution is that we have the development of companies that, that are that are based on what's called zero price tools, right? So you don't, you don't pay in money for Google services. You don't, or I mean, you pay for some of them, but you don't pay in money for Facebook services or, or certain Amazon services. Um, you pay in other ways with an exchange of data or you don't necessarily pay, but the, the revenue that, uh, an av that a newspaper used to get from you being a, a reader and advertisers wanting to reach you now goes through a different intermediary. So there's a shift in revenue but it, it happens on the producer side. So anyway, that's, that's the, the, the Clayton Act should prohibit these kinds of mergers. It was obvious at the time, I guess, and I didn't know this because I was dealing with the financial crisis, but when Zuckerberg bought Instagram and when he bought WhatsApp, everyone in Silicon Valley was like, oh yeah, that's just to take out a rival or to make sure that there was no rival to him. And yet the people at the FTC, the, these were Obama people too, and Republicans, um, they were like, oh, well, we can't measure any particular harm so we, we shouldn't litigate this. And they, they didn't challenge a single merger of Google, Facebook, or Amazon. And like, I think that just indicates just how flabby the interpretations have become, where if you have these giant, most powerful companies in the economy, and they, they, there wasn't a single challenge to any of their mergers. Now, what these guys will say, right, what the, the, the lawyers will say, and the sort of antitrust establishment says is, 
well, not a single one of these mergers was anti-competitive, right? And Google is just a function of efficiency and Amazon's a function of efficiency and Facebook's a function of efficiency. And if they had bought Instagram, if they hadn't bought Instagram, Instagram wouldn't be as big as it is now. So, you know, you get Instagram as a result of the merger. So that, that's the kind of way that they would make the argument. And that you're leaving out Amazon. You should say a little bit about Amazon's abuses too. Well, yeah, I mean, Amazon's more complicated, but yeah, they, they bought, um, they did a number of things. They bought a, a company called Kiva Robotics, which, which was just a where, helped them um, establish their lead in warehousing. So they, that was a robotics company that sold warehouse robots. And then once Amazon bought it, they stopped selling their robots to, to rival uh, warehousing companies. Um, there was an, also a company called diapers.com. So diapers.com, uh, it was called Quidzy, but their site was diapers.com. They sold to parents and they were a competitor to Amazon and Amazon um, uh, checked their prices and said, we are going to underprice you for diapers and the things that you sell. And we are willing to lose a hundred million dollars a month to underprice you uh, and destroy your business unless you sell out to us. And that was a way of saying, not just to diapers and diapers.com did sell out. That's illegal, by the way. That's predatory pricing. Um, it's just that we don't enforce the law. Uh, but but Amazon um, plays that kind of thuggish game, and that was not just a signal. That was not just to take out a competitor like diapers.com. That was to signal to every single person that was thinking about creating a competitor, or every single venture capitalist that was thinking about financing a competitor, that they shouldn't bother. And and uh, and Amazon's bought Goodreads and I think ABE Books. I mean, there there are more yeah, uh, Audible as well. They, they, Audible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're over and over again. They're they're just monopolizing. So it, it, and this, Whole Foods too, but that, that that's a little more complicated. But yeah, we have a huge problem. There, there's no enforcement of of these laws that are on the books. What do we do? Well, I think that this is a crisis of the rule of law, and it's not just antitrust. There's effectively no enforcement of white collar crime laws, because if there had been enforcement of white collar crime laws, then, you know, Trump wouldn't have had a cabinet to hire, right? Because a lot of those guys were, were committing crimes during the financial crisis. Amen. Um, and, you know, and Cy Vance should have put Jared and Ivanka in jail. I mean, you know, all of these women coming out and talking about how Trump, you know, assaulted them or whatever. Where were the prosecutors then, right? I mean, we have, a, have a, a, a crisis of the rule of law that goes back decades because we simply did not enforce the law on the powerful. There's this great quote that I used in my book by G.K. Chesterton who said, you know, the poor occasionally um, object to being governed badly. The rich always object to being governed at all, right? And that's essentially the dynamic that we've been facing since the 1980s, although it's gotten worse because we did in fact, you know, Reagan and Bush, the first Bush, put a, a, a thousand white collar executives in jail for the savings and loan crisis. Even George W. Bush put a bunch of people in jail for Enron, people that, by the way, the Obama administration let out of jail early, like I think Ken, Ken Stilling. And then that just during the latest financial crisis, we didn't send anyone to jail because there was no enforcement of white collar criminal laws. And I think antitrust is basically an enforce, it's a check on the power of the powerful. And when we should stop enforcing that, which we kind of really did starting in the 80s, and then we fully stopped enforcing it in the late 90s, early 2000s, this is what you get. You get a society dominated by powerful, kind of crooked, lawless, white collar people, which is so, what the Trump administration is. Okay, so I just ask you, what do we do? And you describe the problem. Well, I think the, the what do we do is we, we elect, uh, you know, people that want to govern and we demand that they govern, right? I mean, we chose, we all supported, the last president was, was President Obama. You know, I think he's got 95% approval ratings by Democrats. You know, that's a choice every Democrat gets to make about whether to support their leader when they are not, you know, when they are choosing not to enforce the law. I saw this during the financial crisis. It was almost impossible to get Democrats to put any pressure on the Obama administration to do the righteous thing. And so Obama didn't do the righteous thing because he didn't believe in it. And because there were, there, he, he didn't have to listen to the people that were saying, hey, this is, this is wrong, these foreclosures, this amnesty for white collar crooks. We don't have to do that again. We can choose to elect people who are actually going to enforce the law or try to enforce the law, and we can support them when they do and criticize them when they don't. Um, so that's, you know, that's the way that I would, and it works too, because like if you look at right now, there are investigations um, in Congress. And at the state level of big tech, there are investigations under the Trump 
DOJ Antitrust Division and the Trump FTC of big tech. And it's because we've put pressure on them and they do ultimately respond to pressure. Um, so, so we can change this and we are in fact changing it. Well, I think we really need to do a lot more. I really think that a lot of politicians are afraid to speak out and say what needs to be done because they'll be told that it can't be done. There's so much can't doism going on. Absolutely. Can't doism. I love it. We're addicted to powerlessness and we don't have to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, before we, we finish, pardon me? We can do it. We can do it. We so can I, do it. I want you to talk a little bit about Open Markets Institute. This is your new organization that you're relatively recently a part of. What is that about? You know, I'd actually like to, I'd like to stick with the book if you don't mind. Oh. I'm just, um, yeah, I just want to, I'm happy to talk about the anti-monopoly movement in general, but um, yeah, I just, uh, so, so I think I'll just talk about the movement in general because it's like the movement so is broader up. than we've what. Got, we've got like three minutes left, so wrap up. Okay, so, so the, the, the anti-monopoly movement really started in the early 2000s, kind of coming out of the net neutrality. It was like anger at it, the war in Iraq. It started, um, the first big moment was, the, was, the, was about a fight between telecom monopolists over a rule called net neutrality to protect the open internet from, from those telecoms. And then in the financial crisis, we started to notice that these banks were too big to fail. And then in the starting 2011, 2012, um, Barry Lynn, who, who started Open Markets, noticed that we had stopped enforcing antitrust, um, antitrust uh, uh, law. And, uh, and he, you know, and Lena Khan, who he trained, is a scholar who wrote about the consumer welfare standard. And then Elizabeth Warren in, in, in a whole bunch of groups, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and just a whole bunch of groups started to focus on the problem of monopoly. Um, and that's kind of when I got involved. I was involved in the net neutrality stuff, but I got back involved in the financial crisis. And what you see is this network of people that are really led by kind of Elizabeth Warren and, and Katie Porter and some of those types of people um, coming out and saying, we have a problem with concentrated financial power. Um, Bernie Sanders. To, uh, yeah, Bernie Sanders, well, Bernie Sanders was, you know, he's, he's definitely comes out of that tradition. Um, and he definitely did say a bunch of things, but in terms of really being on the, like, a brutal, you know, knife fighting inside Congress uh, during the foreclosure crisis, it, it was really, it was like, um, you know, there, were, there was Brad Miller, there were, there were a couple of others. Bernie was, is more of like a speaker to the outside. He doesn't do that internal knife fighting. Um, so yeah, he's an, definitely an important figure. And I think in 2016, his campaign, I guess you're right, yeah, his campaign in 2016 was a really important moment for the anti-monopoly movement. Um, and then Trump as well. I mean, Trump attacked the AT&T Time Warner merger in 2016 when he was running. And so we put, um, we put antitrust back in the Democratic platform in 2016, and it's just kind of exploded from there. And so this book, Goliath, is a kind of history for people who want to take on monopolies and want to restore democracy. It's about what really happened. It's about who we are as a people and what we can do. All right. And uh, what can people do? What, what, would, what are some steps that people can take besides buying the book? What can they do to start fighting monopolies? What can they tell their politicians? What can they do with their local politics? I mean, I think, you know, look, Start, honestly, do start with the book, right? It is important to know. It is important to be equipped. Because I think people, we underestimate the importance of education, the importance of, of developing ourselves, and that confidence that we have of knowing our stories. And we don't know those stories. And so, like, I'm, a really, I'm really good at politics, but I didn't know those stories. And so I was handicapped. And a lot of your viewers are going to be really good at politics, too. And they're going to see things, and they're going to be creative. And I can't tell you how to see things and be creative in your own life. However, I can help equip you with the tools to see that there are people like you throughout history who have done so. So do buy the book, read the book, Goliath, 100 Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy, and recognize that whoever you are, whatever your identity, wherever you are, we all face the same power arrangements and we can restore democracy if we work together to do it. Do you have a website? Yeah, so mattstoller.com, M-A-T-T-S-T-O-L-L-E-R.com. Okay, thanks so much, Matt. You've been listening to Matt Stoller. He's the author of Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. Thanks, Matt.
Hey, thanks a lot, Rob. Talk to you later.